Ladies and gentlemen of the AFC, we'd like to welcome you guys to our stream. I'm DJ Just J, and we have a very, very special guest on my show. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with No Limit Records or if you're familiar with the history and all of that good stuff. But right about now, they have a documentary going on on BT Network. Shout out to BT, by the way, with the No Limit Chronicles. They're telling the story about the history of one of the biggest, I would say, Southern music movements, like in the, like, ever in history and really just in music in general they did a lot of things but one thing that most people don't know is kind of how you create this entire movement it's not just something that happens overnight it's not something that only one person does or anything like that it is a collective of moving pieces and what i wanted to do was try to capture as many as much of that as possible one of those individuals who is in my opinion responsible for you know, some of the things that you guys got a chance to experience is the gentleman on my screen. This is Tobin Costin, otherwise known as TC. How's that? How you doing? I'm good. How about That's yourself, brother? <laughs> I'm doing great. I mean, I, you know, wow, I feel like I'm, I'm a star or something. You, you just know how to take care of people. That's, that's all I know. You know how to take care of people. Brother, it's an absolute honor, man. And if you guys are not familiar with him, he he does a lot of things. Like, I don't want to uh, misquote anything that, that he does or what he represents. Would you like to kind of give people an idea about your position, not only in life, but with uh, pertaining to No Limit? Well, absolutely. My name is Tobin T.C. Costin. I am a former executive vice president at No Limit Records, also a business manager and personal manager for Master P. Uh, currently, I am a professor at a small university in Oakland, California called Holy Names University, Go Hawks. Uh, and uh, I also am an entrepreneur. I have my own business. Uh, I have a company called Psycho Cider, do uh, hard cider out here in California, as well as, uh, you know, I have my own platform, uh, the Costin and Hammer Network, CHN, that I'm actually using uh, with a partner of mine named Josh Hammer. And we are raising money uh, for the Special Olympics. So that's pretty much what I got going on right now uh, in wonderful, too hot California right now. That's awesome, man. What 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 an awesome thing. Like I say, not only to have been a part of so much that we know as history, but then the stuff that you got going on now. You know, I definitely wouldn't expect anything less for you to be just doing some amazing stuff. And also, film producer, yes? Yes. I am definitely a film producer and an actor. I have a movie called The Reverend Do Wrong Ain't Right. It's right now on Amazon uh, Video Prime. It's a uh, prime video. Uh, last year it came out. It did really well. It was in the top 20 on Amazon. Uh, Amazon. So I was happy about that. And now, as a gift to the world, I just put it up for free on YouTube. So if you have YouTube and, and you're on YouTube, uh, just look up the Reverend Do Wrong Ain't Right or look up the Costa and Hammer Network and you'll see it right there on there for you to watch and enjoy. It's a funny movie and I think people will enjoy it just because there's so many different actors on there that really that you will notice and you will recognize. So it's pretty cool. That's awesome. And if you don't mind, uh, with your permission, do you mind if I just show the trailer? It's really quick. Yeah, absolutely. You can show the trailer. It was produced by myself as well as... Uh, the producer of Friday, W.E. Baker. So he produced the first Friday movie with Ice Cube. So it's a, it's a treat. All right, guys. Without any further ado, I, I don't think I have to play the fair usage in this case. So here we go. I'm going to just go ahead and throw this on the screen so you guys can take a look. Reverend Do Wrong. From the producers of the cult movie classic Friday, Reverend Do Wrong is the new hit comedy that will have... Let me make sure I can make it big so you guys can see. So there we go. All right. Here we go. From the producers of the cult movie classic Friday, Reverend Do Wrong is the new hit comedy that will have you in stitches. And now, brothers and sisters, it's time to start your morning off right and not wrong. Starring deaf comedy jam comedian Lester Bibbs and Tobin Costin. Gentlemen, you know that gambling is against everything I teach on a Sunday morning and against the law. One more set of box cars. I'm telling you, one more set of box cars, and Daddy can go home a rich man. Oh, come on, give it. We want to ask our good friend, Reverend Do Wrong, to lead us in prayer. Feel. Featuring platinum recording artist Yo Yo. How long have you been with 
out. Like I told you before, about five years now. Mm. Introducing Hercules and big time from the nutty professor and old school. See, we can get the ladies, cause you know that's no problem. See, little check it. When we start hollering at the ladies, you know his legs over shoulders, boy. You know I can feel me. Can you feel me? Leg over. Co-starring Bill Lee Brown and Victor Tagunde from Can Hardly Wait. Do you want the station manager position or not? Look out for this hilarious hit on iTunes and Amazon On Demand because the Reverend just can't do right. Your host, will he do wrong? Reverend Do Wrong Ain't Right is coming in the summer of 2018. Right, and I'm going to tell you guys, just so y'all know, full disclosure, I did get a chance to watch it while I was out in New Orleans, even more special to me because of where I did it, but I thought it was extremely funny. I mean, it, it brings in your attention, but I thought you guys did an awesome job on that. All right, you know, I really appreciate it. I think uh, when you start to write ideas and you write the story and you say, hey, this is what it's going to be. And you see it and you bring people that really know how to make great movies like Bill Baker, W.E. Baker. You know, for someone to, to do a movie like that's iconic like Friday and to say, yes, I'll work with you on this project. I felt really happy about what we came up with. And I'm looking forward to do another project with him, hopefully in the next couple of years. COVID kind of slowed down everything for everyone. So I'm hoping maybe uh, uh, maybe 2021, 2022, we figure this thing out and do the next movie. Awesome. I definitely can't wait. Um, and again, you guys can also check that out, not only from Amazon, but you can also check it out for free on YouTube. It's a very easy thing to do. And while we're speaking of free, one thing that is free for you guys to click that thumbs up, please share this live stream. Let other people know that we're live, who we're talking to. Come check us out. Also, for you people watching on a replay, make sure you guys leave your comments. Here's where I would love to start with you as far as um, how does this story start with you? And, um, and No Limit and Master B, how, how does this whole thing kind of come into fruition? So uh, back in 1992, uh, I'm a radio DJ and I, at, a, at a college radio station, Gonzaga University in Spokane, Washington. So I hosted my own show on the radio station there, KAGU. It was a show called The Rap Attack. So the funny thing is I was doing a show and I don't even, it was so long ago, I don't remember who it was. There was a rapper who was supposed to show up and he kind of flaked on me pseudo the last minute. I think I had a couple of days and I'm talking to my God brother kind of venting. And he says, Hey, I know this guy named master P, you know, he's got this, uh, he's got this project out, you know, no one really knows who he is. He's got a, you know, he doesn't really have a big following, but man, he's a hustler and he's always trying to do shows. You should see if you can get him to come. I'll talk to him. So my god brother talks to him and then we gets us on the phone and i say hey come can you do the show and he shows up mm. so and at that point you know he he kind of paid for his own way to come up i was able to put him in a hotel and feed him and do some stuff like that but uh he came up and we absolutely hit it off uh did some songs uh the show turned out pretty well you know we had this thing where we set up where we we had you know dj and, and mixing i was mixing a little bit and then we had him come on and perform, and it was fun. Now, I don't know if the, the world was really, you know, say, hey, great, this is, this is great music or anything, but it was really cool because, you know, at that time in Spokane, Washington, nobody was really understanding hip-hop, and, and I was the only one spinning hip-hop, so we had a, a great success. So Master P and I, we had a good relationship from there, and we just kept in contact. So he would send me records, and I'd play them on my radio station or my radio show, and I would promote for him and do all that stuff. So in 1993, he had asked me to come on board and do promotions for him. So I started doing promotion. You know, anytime a project came out, do promotion, and I'm working for No Limit Records, and things are going well. So in 1994, and, and before that, and I don't know if people are familiar with, there's a gentleman named St. Charles. Uh, he's E-40's uncle. Yeah. So St. Charles taught E-40, Be Legit, myself, P, a rapper named JT, the bigger figure. There was a rapper named Sibo. 
he literally taught all of us the music business, how to run a record label, how to do distribution, how to get your pre-orders up, how to make sure you get paid, how to go get the money. So I was promoting some records and, and stuff for saying or, or playing them on my radio show. And in, 19, uh, in 1994, he is the one that told Master P and said, hey, you really, Tobin's a good guy, he's sharp, you got some things, you guys together could be unstoppable. You should you should make Tobin your manager and have him run the label. Mm. And at that time, um, almost immediately, he, uh, P said, hey, I want you to manage me. I want you to run the label. Um, you've got a lot of ideas, energy. Let's go make this thing happen. I think we could be the biggest thing in the world. Right. And that's how we came together. So in 94... Prior to that, prior to us hooking up, so between 89 and 93, P probably put out mm, seven, 16, 17 projects, and they all were albums, but they were singles, and, and if you watch the Chronicles, they kind of mention that, that he put out some projects that not necessarily would be something you put out. It would be something that you probably would, you know, maybe be a demo, but maybe not even be a demo, but he was just dropping projects and dropping projects. So it's kind of like the, the modern day equivalent to mixtapes. Correct. He was just, but they, instead of just being online, because we didn't have that back then, it was it was dropping him in the stores. And at that time, you know, No Limit Records, or it was really the record store, and P was putting out records, but he's probably selling 80, 100 t tapes, you know, maybe 120 tapes. So there wasn't really anything going on as far as the high volume. Mm -hmm. You know, not a lot of people knew who P was. Um, you know, if you hear people talk, a lot of times it was stuff that, you know, people would just weren't interested in. So in 1993, when I came on board, I was still playing the music on my radio show. I was still going out promoting and, and getting, you know, passing out T-shirts, doing that whole process to kind of build things. And we did an album um, called uh, Who's the Killer, the TRU album. So it was like Master P. King George, Big Ed, Sip the Shocker. So we put this project together. So in 94, when I became the, the head of the label and I became his manager, we put together an album called uh, The Ghetto's Trying to Kill Me. So The Ghetto's Trying to Kill Me, if you've seen that album, it's King George, the rapper King George. He's sitting in the window and he's got a gun in his hand and Master P is in bed with this woman and King George was, it was imagery of King George is the ghetto and Master P is about to get killed because he got caught up with this lady in the bed. And that album came out and that was the first album um, that I was in charge where I was the manager and I would ran the label. It was about building the story because the story was the important piece that was going to tell everyone who we are and what was going on. Mm -hmm. Now, whether we got lucky or unlucky, there was, at the time, there was this young kid, I think he was 19, he was unfortunately robbing people. So he was robbing liquor stores, robbing people at the, at the uh, ATMs, and he, got, he eventually got caught. So what happened, when, when, what happened when he, he got caught, he told the police that the reason why he did it was because Master P's song on The Ghetto's Trying to Kill Me called 211. And in the song, P talks about 211, 211, rob a liquor store. So he, so you want to talk about, you know, uh, the world of life imitating art. That's what happened. So once he said that and they interviewed him in the newspaper and he interviewed him on this kid on TV and he said, Master P is 211 is, is what made me um, do these robberies. The, the album became an immediate success. Wow. People were buying it because they wanted to know, like, who is, what's going on? Right. So understand, prior to that, there was minimal distribution, selling 100 tapes at a time, not really having success, but putting this album out that was really well done, that was more of a professional album, and then the whole thing with the 211 in, in the newspaper and the TV made the album kind of shoot up, kind of kind of shoot up and shoot out the door, and people were buying that. So during that time, we put a couple other projects out that were successful, but Master P had this idea that he wanted to take all of the popular rappers on the West Coast 
and put them all on one project together and call it the West Coast Bad Boys. Mm -hmm. Now, the great thing about that idea, if you were from a particular town and you were popular and someone else was from another particular town, it's like you co-signed for each other. So with all of these artists on there, they co-signed for Master P to say, hey, Master P is a cool dude. He's down with us. And it kind of it, it was kind of something special. Now, the one thing is he came up with the idea for the album itself, putting it together and having these guys all on it. But I came up with the idea of putting his name on it, Master P Presents. Mm -hmm. So even though the compilation for the West Coast Bad Boys and the West Coast Bad Boys was the group, Master P's name was on top. And with Master P's name on top, people would think it was a Master P record. Okay. So we we put all of these popular rappers like Rappin' Forte, JT the Bigger Figure, C Bo, uh, obviously people in our camp like King George and Silk the Shocker, all of these folks are on this album. And they were really popular on the West Coast. And we dropped this album. Master P presents the West Coast Bad Boys. Master P presents the West Coast Bad Boy sells an incredible amount of units. And what was so amazing about this, we were on the Billboard charts. So imagine from 1993 I start to 1994, we go with the ghettos trying to kill me. We put out a couple other projects that had success. And then we ran, then we, we put ourselves in a situation where we put the West Coast Bad Boys out and we are on Billboard charts. Mm, right. So no little records, uh, P said in the Chronicles, it wasn't an overnight success. It wasn't, but that, but that West Coast bad boys really put us on the map and got people excited about who we are and what we're doing. Nice, nice. So at that time, when the West Coast bad boys was out, we we put out you know a couple other projects. One of them was called uh, High for Christmas. It was uh, West Coast Bad Master presents West Coast Bad Boy High for Christmas. It was about it was basically talking about uh, living in the hood, being from the hood, but getting high while doing it. And it was it, it showed uh, King George on the cover uh, with this with this whole beard and white beard, and he was he was Santa Claus, and they were and the guys were smoking weed around him. It was a funny cover. Mm -hmm. So that project had a lot of success. So the next project we wanted to do was we wanted to have Master P have his coming out party. And the coming out party is like, okay, we're on Billboard charts with the West Coast Bad Boys. Uh, Master P presents the West Coast Bad Boys. We did the West Coast Bad Boys High for Christmas. We had work with Lil Rick. We, so we had all these projects that were hot, Dangerous Dame. And now it was time for us to show the world the Master P project. And this album was called 99 Ways to Die. So we put this record together by, and this to me is one of my favorite albums, No Limit Albums, is because we, we've got these different producers with different sounds on there to do this album, and it made the album sound, for lack of a better term, more professional. It was a good sound, it was good music, it was, it was, it was really good producers. Master P got better at rapping. Um, King George was money with the hooks. So it was like all of these people all of these people coming together to make this Master P album, which was the 99 Ways to Die. Right. So once we did that album, we had the 99 Ways to Die, it drops and we put it on Billboard charts. Like it's huge. It's literally, I think we were at 40, 45, 46 on Billboard charts. Now, while the West Coast Bad Boys was out prior to dropping 99 Ways to Die, we were traveling we're kind of doing the road show to all these different record companies because people were interested in Master P because Master P presents. He's the leader of these West Coast Bad Boys guys, so people were interested. Mm -hmm. We were already promoting TRU album. We were promoting King George. We were promoting Sick the Shocker. We were promoting the Down South Hustlers. We were promoting all these albums. So anyone who's a No Limit fan, if you open up a CD, you'll see all of the No Limit records that are coming out. That was our entire concept. We wanted people to get excited about our projects and they knew they were coming. Well, I can so, tell you this from personal experience. I know that that's like a nostalgia thing for me right there because every time I went to go buy one album, I'm like, okay, I got this one. You're happy about that project. <laughs> then it's like you open that thing, you crack it up, and it's like, what's coming <laughs> out? Man, and I, like, I, I like, said it all like on my calendar. <laughs> yes. Oh, man, yeah. Yes. It was like an accordion. You'd open it up and be like, oh my God, how many albums do these guys have? And what we were good about 
was always promoting the album before and having the artwork done and talking about what was next and all that stuff. That was all about our focus. So people would be going to the stores waiting for the next project. So at that time we were traveling, we're going to New York and LA, New York and LA, trying to figure out what, you know, we're going to sign this deal and try, we wanted to get a deal. We wanted to get a deal. So there were two major companies. There were several companies offering this deal, but the two major ones were, uh, Big Beat Atlantic in New York and MCA in Los Angeles. Uh, MCA offered us $500,000 advance plus uh, I think it was like 12% of the record sales. And Hank Shockley, and I don't know if people know who Hank Shockley is, if you know of a group called Public Enemy, he is the individual who created Public Enemy. He's one of the folks that was behind the Flavor Flav and Chuck D movement. He also produced Ice Cube's first album, America's Most Wanted. Oh. So he was well known um, and he wanted to, to do a deal. Big Beat Atlantic, there was this record executive called Craig Coleman. He wanted to do a deal and it was a $750,000 deal, but it was 10 years. So both deals were, you know, it was a lot of money, you know, especially you talk about 1995, right? Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lot of money. So what we did, uh, P wanted to sign with uh, Big Beat Atlantic. That was his thing. He's like, man, I want to sign with Big Beat Atlantic. It's important to me. Uh, and, and, it's, and he wanted to do an artist deal. The reason why he wanted to do an artist deal, he wanted to get the $750,000 and invest it into No Limit Records. No Limit Records was always the focus, but he wanted to kind of fall on the sword, if you will, and say, hey, I'm gonna, we're going to sign this deal. I'm going to sacrifice the Master P name and we're going to put all of our money behind Silk the Shocker. Uh, at that time, Silk the Shocker was a young, good-looking kid. Um, you know, he, he, he could rap. Uh, the girls liked him because he was good-looking. The guys liked what he was talking about. He was doing different styles. He was saying the things young people wanted to hear. So that was important to, to P and also to me. I said, okay, if this is what we're going to do, we're going to roll it. Well, P wanted to sign, and I was like, eh, I don't know. Now, the money was enticing, and I was excited about that. And really, the two people that were excited more than, than any of us was King George and Sea Murder. Mm -hmm. Now, after I read the contract, the contract stated it was a 10-year deal, and yes, we're going to get $750,000, and the deal was for, I believe it was 14, 14%. Okay. And... And that's 14, you're getting 14% of your album. And at that time, it was probably pretty good because most people were getting between 6 and 12 or 8 and 12%. So, you know, Steve Murder literally wants to beat me up because he's like, we're gonna, you're, you're screwing us at 750, you're crazy because I'm saying, no, we're not signing this. So when I read the contract, the contract says that Master P doesn't own his name or likeness. He can't rap on anyone's record unless the company gives them permission. So I tell P, I said, well, you understand if you sign this deal, you'd be giving up a whole lot. Yeah, you, you, you will definitely be giving up a whole lot, but you can't even rap on the label that you're trying to put money into to blow up. Right. So C murder says, man, that's not what the guy said. He didn't say that. And I told him, I said, look, I don't care what the guy said. What's being, what's in the contracts in the contract. Yep, because that's, like that's, that's all they're going. Because that's all they're going to use in court. Exactly. So we don't sign the deal. King George and C Murder want to kill me. Master P is like, "Are you sure?" And the one thing about my relationship with Master P, we had a really good one. He would always say to me, "Are you sure?" Because you're gambling with everything we got. That was like we'd have that every any time was something that wasn't popular for him or something that I said. He would say, are you sure you're gambling with everything we got? Mm -hmm. So at that time, I said, I'm 100% sure. So once then we dropped the 99 ways to die, that was kind of we're rolling the dice. So at that, so what my thought process is, yeah, we're going to drop this album. It's going to be huge because I knew it was really good. And we're coming off the West Coast Bad Boys and the High for Christmas. And everyone knows who we are. And I'm thinking we're going to blow this thing up big. P was like, okay, I'm with you. And he believed in me and we went that route. So we, we, we dropped the 99 ways to die. It goes to, to the charts. I think it's like 46, 44 on the charts, billboard charts. And 
that's when Priority Records, because they had talked to us before, but they really weren't feeling our, our vision. They said, hey, we want to talk to you. So we had, we knew about Priority Records because there was a producer and a rapper named EA Ski who already had to deal with them, and then he kind of talked to us about them. Mm-hmm. So they knew who we were by that time. And then what do you say? You know, you got, I think the, the West Coast Bad Boys were in the 60s or 70s on the Billboard charts. Then we popped the, 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 the 99 Ways to Die was on in the 40s. And then they were like, okay, we want to do a deal. So when we sat down and negotiated, we did an 85%, 15% split. So we as the record record label got 85%. Priority as the distributor got fifteen percent. Okay, wait, so, wait, so so you're actually talking about the famous deal that a lot of people have heard about. Correct. Okay. So at that time, we negotiate, we sign eighty five fifteen percent. So they're asking, "What's your next? What's the next album?" So they took the ninety nine ways to die because on that cover the ninety nine ways to die had King or had excuse me had, had P with two guns in his hand he's smoking a cigar two guns in his hand his, his shirts off and everyone was it was everyone was all about that cover and they got it well when we got with priority we're going to ship more units and all that stuff we changed the cover we P's in the sky he's looking up in the sky and then there's a there's a hearse with triple gold Dayton's and he did this wonderful song kind of an ode to his brother his little brother got killed Kevin Miller it was called when they gone and then and 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 I think it was it was one of those things that was kind of heartfelt and was popular and we did a video and and it just things started to take off from there so the question was what is your next album well the next album was true TRU and the name of the album is called true so P and I knew like we needed to put everybody who was on, put them out so we could start building their names up even bigger because everyone's waiting on these solo projects, but everyone would really build their names up so we can drop those albums too. So we did the TRU album and we're, we're rocking the record and every, we're, we're putting these albums together and we're writing them in, in, in uh, record time. P goes down to New Orleans. So he goes down to New Orleans he there's a couple things he he gets with me at x and wants to sign me at x he you know meets with servon and klc and 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 talks to them about coming coming out and he does i'm about it now i'm about it is a record that everybody knows but at that time p records like a one minute jingle for uh q93 wild wing it was the intro to his his show so it was, he would talk about who's bad or are you bad it in, in everywhere. And then he started naming off the third ward and, and the different seventh ward and the ninth ward. So he started naming the wards off. So people started to want to listen to it like it's a record. And it was one of those things, well, dude, it's a jingle. Mm-hmm. So P comes back to the West Coast and he says, hey, um, I want to uh, I want to sign these artists. I'm like, okay, we put this deal together. They're going to come out. Um, we need to, We need to get them out here on the West Coast. I went and got apartments for for got an apartment for them. So at that time, it was Mia X came out, uh, Servon came out, uh, KLC came out, and Moby Dick. So they all came out and they lived in that apartment. So I signed all the paperwork, did all the stuff, put the deposit down, and had them in the apartment. And at that time, that's when they were recording, recording, recording. We started doing beats and tracks, and we're going to the studio, and we were just nonstop recording. So we do, so the I'm about it, which is just at that point a jingle, I'm listening to it. I'm like, man, this is a hit record. And he says, you know, are you sure? Are you sure? I'm like, I'm telling you, this is a hit record. We're going to start talking about it. Everybody's about it. They're going to love it. And then they go back in the studio on the West Coast in California, KLC, um, you know, fattens the track up and makes it into the I'm about it that the whole world knows. Okay. So we talked about putting I'm about it on the down South hustlers. We talked about putting it on the West or excuse me, on the down South hustlers or the ice cream man. But we're like, no, we need a hit record for TRU. Now TRU album was really good, but this, the, the I'm about a song, put it over the top. So we took that record 
me, him and me actually did a, a did a verse each and a hook and I'm about it. Talk about everyone's about it. He, he shouts out King George and Silk. He shouts out my manager TC's about it, about it. Yeah, so, he sure did. I forgot about that. Yeah, everybody, everybody got their little got their shine on there, right? Yeah. So we put that on the TRU album, and we dropped that album. It hits Billboard charts. So at that time, you know. Usually when you drop an album, you got to wait 90 days to get paid. You don't usually get money right away. And we were doing okay, but, you know, financially, you know, we had a lot of mouths to feed and we're doing a lot and we had to figure something out. So Priority's happy. They're like, wow, first record's hot. I'm about it's hot. They said, well, what's your next project? We, But they had wanted the Down South Hustlers because it almost like we gave them True because we, we wanted to get that out because we know if we got True going, then we hit the Down South Hustlers, and by the time we got the Ice Cream Man, the game is over. We're going to be the biggest, biggest record company in the country, and that's kind of how, how kind of how uh, it came into fru fruition. So they said, "Well, hey, we need this Down South Hustlers." And at this time, we were still recording, right? We're we're recording. We had some of the songs, not not all of them, but we had some of the songs. Um, so Mark Cerami, who is the president of sales at Priority, he was the president of sales and partners with Brian uh, Turner. He said, well, what is it going to take for you guys to get this down South Hustlers? We need it right away. Everyone's clamoring for it. And understand, we had already promoted the down South Hustlers, so people were waiting for it anyway. So we said $250,000. You give us $250,000, we're going to be able to knock this thing out and finish it up. Okay. Well... They gave us $250,000 and they said, we'll give you this, but you're going to have to give us 5%. So we said, okay, it was 80% for no limit, 20% for uh 20% for priority. We got the money. And then that was the thing, what we were able to do, how we were able to bring uh, UGK out to the West coast to produce uh, records and songs for, um, for the down South hustlers. That's how we were able to get. Uh, that's how we were able to get Eight Ball and MGG and get PKO, and CCG, and the Dayton family and Eight Ball. So all all those folks. That's how we were able to do that. Okay. So at that time, Down South Hustlers were getting that getting that done. We're recording the Ice Cream Man at the same time. We're recording Mia X had a single and we were doing her EP. So we were just recording like crazy and putting all the putting all this together so we were going back and forth between the west coast and down south so understand that master p and i have a great relationship king george is like his best friend and we were just things were rocking and rolling we're on the billboard charts everyone's happy with what we're doing we're about to blow up so we're down in Louisiana and we're kind of going back and forth. So we decide we're going to throw this party. We, we used to throw these pool parties and different parties down in New Orleans. So we threw this big party and it was like, and then we, I think we did a party and then we're doing a bikini contest and we're doing all this stuff and UGK was performing, we're performing and we, we, we just did this show. So at that time, and I don't know if people know Big Ed was, Big Ed was a member of TRU originally, and then he had his own uh, success as uh, Big Ed the Assassin, and unfortunately he's no longer with us. Um, he he was starting to have a relationship with P's cousin, and they wound up getting married, so I mean at this point, it doesn't really matter, but, and unfortunately he's no longer with us, he started having a relationship with, uh, he started having a relationship with P's cousin. And I don't think P really liked that. And I think there was, there was a challenge with that. And, you know, anytime when you deal with family members, um, you know, that could be difficult. So we throw this party. P says, Hey, you know, let's go to LA. And I said, Hey man, I've been, I've been away. I've been away for a long time for weeks on the road. I said, I'm gonna go home for a few days. And then when you're done in LA, just meet me up there. So, I think the New Orleans folks, um, they stayed another day or two, and then they came out. And when I say the New Orleans folks, I'm talking KLC, Moby, uh, Mia, Servon. They come out. And Ed is, I get a phone call from Ed, or I think I get a page from him, and I call him back. And we had pagers back then, so we didn't have phones. And Ed says, P left me in New Orleans. 
I was like, wait a minute, what are you talking about? He left you in New Orleans. He's like, no, he left me in New Orleans. There's no ticket for me. <laughs> so he's furious. Big Ed is upset. He's like, I can't believe he'd do this to me. He's so upset. So P and I talk. I, so I call P and I said, what's going on? You left Ed in New Orleans? What are you doing? And he said, well, if he wants to do his own thing, he can just stay there. Or he'll find his own way home. And I said, well, I'm not going to do that. He said, well, you do whatever you, he said, you do whatever you got to do or whatever you want to do. It's on you. You decide. I said, well, I'm going to fly him home. He's like, all right, all right, cool. So I fly at home. Ed's furious, furious at P. And it was like, he was mad because, you know, you got to, you go from, from New Orleans, it's probably about a good four hour, five hour flight from New Orleans to Oakland. Mm -hmm. Sure. You have to stop somewhere and you got a layover. You're fuming because you feel that, you know, P left you stuck and he clearly he did. So he shows up to Oakland. I picked him up from the airport and we were talking and he's just like mad. He's so mad. He's so mad. He's so mad. And I said, just calm down. We'll figure it out. He's like, no, nah, no, nah, P, you know, did me like this. I can't believe it. Man, I'm, I'm leaving the group. I'm leaving the group. Well, I had said, well, I don't want you to leave the group. However, if you decide to leave the group, I will help you. That was the, the conversation we had. Okay. So the next day, we go to lunch. So it's myself, him, and King George. Just go to lunch like we would do on a normal day, you know, if, if we're around. Um, P was still out of town, and King Ed and I went to lunch. So this entire time, Ed is still furious. We're like a day later, he's still, like, you know, furious. Mm -hmm. And he's saying, he's saying, F this, I'm leaving the group, F this, my money's not right, yada, yada, yada. Go, just going, just kind of furious. And he and King just said to him, King George, he said to him, like, look, he says, we've gone this far with it, I'm going to ride this thing out. And he said, if, if my, my single, you know, our solo projects are coming, if things aren't right, then, then that's a different conversation. But we've gotten this far with Tobin and, and, and P, we're going to keep this thing rolling. So again, I reiterated, hey, look, if you're looking to do something, I don't want you to leave. But if you are, I will help you. That was the entire conversation. Mm -hmm. So he said, well, I'm going to talk to P. And I said, well, OK, that sounds good. But King said, man, leave me out of whatever problems you have with P because, you know, I'm riding this thing out. And I said the same thing. I said, look, my relationship's different. P's a partner. I manage him. I run the label. I'm like, you know, we're good. Now, understand, <laughs> anything that I would do or if I was doing it, if I made a buck, P's going to get a piece of that because we're attached at the head. That's how, that's how we work things. Right. You know? <laughs> and... So what happens is he says that and we say, look, leave, we don't want anything to do with it, but we're going to support you because like you would do anybody. He's your boy. We know him. He's our boy. We're going to support him. So he's like, no, nah, no, nah, it's nothing to do with y'all. Nothing to do. I'm going to get this straight. Blah, blah, blah. I mean, I'm, I'm, I need to get my money and I'm leaving the group. So I'm like, whatever. So somehow P and him have a conversation. And I think it's a day later. He calls me. He wants to meet me at like 10 o'clock. And I'm like, okay. Now, right after P called me, King had called me, King George. He called me, and I and I, he said, man, P is mad. I said, yeah. I said, he wants to meet at 10. Why? He says, man, he wants me to do you something. He wants me to basically saying he wants me to beat you up. Mm. And I was like, for what? He said, well, Ed jumped the gun, told him all this stuff that was we're, we're trying to leave and start our own thing and do this. I was like, what is he talking about? Now, understanding this, P and I had never had an argument ever. Three years. Three years together, uh, basically two years as his manager and, 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 and running the label. He never had an argument. So, P, so my thought was, well, okay, this is a big misunderstanding. That's not what happened. We're going to talk to him, and it's cool. So he says, hey, P wants to do this. I'm not King George. That is, I'm not going to let this happen. You never did nothing to us. You've always taken care of us. I said, well, look, I said, no problem. I'm going to talk to P. We're going to iron this thing out. Don't worry about it. So I, I knew nothing physically was going to happen to me because if King George wasn't going to do anything, the, the, the rest of those guys were, they would take his lead on that. They wouldn't just 
just jump me or do anything like that. Mm -hmm. So when P and I get together, we have a conversation and he's very animated, very frustrated. He kept telling me, I want, I want my company back. I want my company back. I said, well, what are you talking about? I haven't stolen any company. He's like, no, I want my company back. I don't want you trying to take artists from me. I want my company back. So we talk about this for several minutes and I'm like, dude, and he's so animated and it's so frustrated. And I'm like, man, what are you talking about? I never, I said, I'm not going anywhere. What are you talking about? So anyway, he says, look, I want my company back. You go your way. I go my way. So we, so the conversation we had was okay. And I said, okay, if that's what you want, but there's money owed. So there, so at that time we had $200,000 in credit card debt that I was responsible for that had my name on. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, we got this $200,000 credit card debt and there's another $200,000 that's owed to me for record sale. Now the record sale piece of it, yes, I'm owed, but the, the, the problem of the, the other piece of the, the, the credit card piece, that's a quantifiable number that's owed that are expenses that that were owed for no limit records but i was re held responsible for for that money so he tells me don't you worry about that credit card i'm gonna pay that credit card i'm gonna pay what i owe you and then that's it we squash it we're not gonna work together i'm gonna go do my thing i'm taking my company back i said okay i said you gonna pay the, pay the credit pay the credit card pay me we're good he said yeah that's it we're done so he leaves I leave and that's, you know, and, and it's the group cause Ed's with them and all these people and, and Ed's sitting, standing there and, and Ed's not even looking me in the eye. Like it's crazy. Mm. So it went from never having a fight to that's it. We're done. Right. So I go home. I'm thinking I'll never see those guys again. I'm going to get, I'm going to get my $200,000 uh, credit cards and all that stuff paid and get, get that squared. And I'm getting another $200,000. So I'm going to go start my own label then. I'm like, okay, well, that's what we're going to do. If that's what you, you know, you're going to, you think I'm trying to steal the company from you. I'll go start my other, my own record company and go from there. And there were, there were companies that I was doing, working on publishing deals and doing stuff like that. And I know P couple times like man you're working on these publishing deals and you got to come through me and i'm like well what do i got to come through you for like i'm setting the deals up you're still going to get a piece of the pie either way so i don't even know why you're worried about it and i think the there was something that happened before this whole big Ed thing there was seventy five thousand dollars was missing from the bank account so he calls me up he's like did you did you write you wrote a check he had said something about like like about me stealing money or something, seventy five thousand. Okay. And he was like, "Did you did you write a check for seventy five thousand dollars?" And I'm like, "No, I would never write a check for that much without talking to you." And generally, at that time, if anything was more than thirty or forty thousand dollars, I'd have a discussion with him. Right. If it was less than that, I would just take care of it. And afterwards, I'll say, "Hey, I just wrote a check for twenty grand for this or whatever it was." I never, I would never write a check for seventy five grand. So here's the here's the craziness of that story. So a year ago, the year prior, not a year ago, but a year prior, he bounced, we bounced a check to Rainbow Records. Rainbow Records was a company that did manufacturing of units of vinyl and all that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So we wrote a check for $75,000 and it bounced. When it bounced, I said to him, I said, do you want me to cancel the check and then we will, you know, we'll either do a certified check or however you want to do it. He said, no, 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 I'll take care of it. Well, long story boring, he never canceled the check. So what happened was we were hot, records were out, we're on billboard charts, Rainbow Records, they read what's going on, they put, they put the check through, and it cleared. And P forgot that there was some, and you have to understand, back then it wasn't like you go online or you go on your phone to look at the bill. We had to get the check. We had to, we had to uh, go to get, the, we, in fact, I think I had to go to get the bank to get the check and because they hadn't sent it out yet or something to that effect because i think we signed that where we didn't need to see all the checks or something like that so we went and got the check and was like oh this is a check from a year ago and he was like and even though he was accusatory 
he never, you know, he never apologized, but it was like, whatever, he was wrong. I, no one tried to steal any money from him. This is, no one was stealing money from the bank account. We're fine. Okay. So fast forward back to the situation with Big Ed. Big Ed has a conversation. He's going to pay me the 200 grand that he owes me for the credit card. He's going to pay me the $200,000 that he owed me on record sales. I'm going to start my label. He's going to go off into the sunset and do his thing with the guys, and I'll never see these guys. I'm going to move in a different direction. So I'm home the next morning, really early. King George calls me. And I was like, dude, what happened? He was like, well, P was mad that I didn't break your jaw and I wouldn't do it. So he kicked me off the crew. Oh, wow. I was like, I was like, what? He said, yeah, he kicked me out the group. He believed Ed. And it was more like he was hurt because you gotta understand, P and King hustled. King went to jail and didn't didn't snitch and did two years in in, in, uh, in Texas for him. When they, they both got involved in something, he did two years in Texas for him. So King was the King is the most was the most loyal guy to Master P on the planet. Right. So here I'm thinking, okay, I'm gonna get my four hundred grand, take care of my credit card situation. You get my money for my label. I'm going to go find me a new artist. I'm going to go make this thing happen. So King says, that's it, man. He told me I'm out the group. And I can't believe that he would do this to me, knowing that I didn't do anything. He said, I can't believe he would do. He was like, I can't even believe he'd do this to you. One I'm complete. One of the most loyal people. I mean, not one of the most, the most loyal person you could imagine. Mm. So, at that time, we, him and I are attached at the hip, whether we like it or not. At no time, and, and so when I watched the Chronicles, at no time did King George and I ever talk about doing an album together. Never. At no time, and first you have to understand, King was so loyal to Pete, if I would have mentioned doing an album with somebody, or, or leaving, or, or I'm a still artist, or whatever, then King probably would have beat me up. That's how loyal he was to Pete. So the fact that he thought that King and I were trying to start on, it, it was just the most ridiculous thing in the world. And I think to this day, because I've had conversations with other people about this, I have no idea why he, because even, because him and Ed at that time, they were cool, but they weren't tight like King and he and King or, or he and I. So he basically told us, good luck, it's hard. We were left on our own. And, you know, he cleared out bank accounts with both our names on it, which is fine. You know, he was, he was able to do that. There was another account that I had that I was running the management from that he cleared that out, that both our names were out. So there's no money anywhere. King, I'm 200, I'm, I'm 24 years old. I've got a baby on the way. I'm $200,000 in debt. And nobody wants to, you know, everybody at that time wants their money up front because I'm TC, I was with No Limit, No Limit's hot, you know, you, you gotta have a ton of money, and I didn't. I was stuck at zero, and as well as King. And that's when, you know, honestly, I start calling everybody. Everybody who I thought that, you know, would have went ahead and did a project with us basically on, on the back end where we would record the album, re release it, and then we'd pay them as we got, got record sales. They all turned me down. I had a conversation with St. Charles, E-40's uncle, who had sold a lot of records, and he knew I was responsible for a lot of records. He turned me down. Mm. And not recently, until after the, the No Limit Chronicles come, came out, I had said, man, why did you... I was, I was, I was kind of hurt. And I said, why wouldn't you do the King George record? He said, Tobin, I called everyone, and nobody wanted to do the record. Nobody thought that King could do an album. And even P said, we need to do some more development with King because he had said, oh man, nobody, King's great at the hooks, King's great at the skits, but nobody wants to hear King for a whole album. Well, at this stage of the game, what, what, what else did I have? I'm 24 years old with a baby on the way and bills due, King had bills due. It was like, okay, what are we gonna do? So, we went through this process of reaching out to everyone. Everyone said no. And finally, one guy, Anthony A.K. Walker, who I probably could have got a whole album done for about $2,000, said yes because we didn't have any money. Mm -hmm. So 
we go to work. We start recording. I'm going out meeting with distributors while we're recording and nobody wants to record. Nobody wants to record. Nobody wants to record. We finished the album. It's called Life of a Kingpin. We've been promoting the album Life of a Kingpin, you know, since we were at No Limit. Everybody knew we were coming out with Life of a Kingpin. But nobody, for whatever reason, if it was because we weren't with P, because people didn't believe in King. And it's not like, I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. It's not like King believed in me and I probably didn't believe in him, but we were attached at the hip because we're the, we had to get out of this hole we were in. Right. And I was really in the big main hole because I had bill collectors call me every day, you know, and anyone who's ever had been behind on bill collectors and they're calling and threatening your life and, and not really your life, but your livelihood. And you, you know, man, I, I'll never be able to get an apartment again or buy a house or anything with this kind of debt. And, and when you think about, you know, for everyone who's watching, you think about two hundred thousand dollars in nineteen ninety six. I mean, two hundred thousand dollars is a lot of money today in twenty twenty. Let me and let me throw this out there: when people are talking about that this that America doesn't give us chances, I mean that's that's a pretty damn big chance right there. I agree. I agree. So, Anthony and K. Walker, we produce the album, we get it done. No one will pick up the record. So here I am with an album done. I'm, I owe a percentage to this producer and I go out and I, 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 I never pulled the cart before the horse except for this time. Cause usually what happens is I would promote the record, find out how many units people want. And then you press, the, you press the units and you have a little bit higher percentage just in case. So you, you don't have to do a reorder on the, the cassettes or CDs or vinyl. Mm -hmm. So I get, uh, you know, I get a $10,000 credit card from my girlfriend at the time's mother who's, who became my wife um, and she had a credit card at $10,000 limit on it and I talked to her and she said I'll give it to you she's like well how are you going to pay this $10,000 back and in the back of my mind I was like uh, how am I going to pay the $10,000 back how am I going to pay the $200,000 back and I just said somehow some way I will do it I grabbed her credit card I pressed up these cassette CDs of vinyl posters and stuff and Nobody wants to record. I get a phone call from Southwest Wholesale down in Houston, Texas, and they said, I oh, will take a few copies. So I send them a few copies. I get a call a few weeks later. I'm sitting there, and the record's not selling. I'm like, what am I going to do? There was this guy in Kansas City, and shout out to the folks in Kansas City who always showed us love at No Limit Records and at Me and My Entertainment with King George. This guy named Myron, who ran a little one-stop, said, I'll buy units from you for $2 a CD and $1 cassette, and I'll send it COD. Well, I kind of said, look, if you make it three and two, you got a deal. Now, here's a funny story. At that time, I'm naive. I don't know how COD works. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize that I'm supposed to set it up where he can't pick up the, the product until he leaves a check for the COD. Okay. So I sent him the, I sent him the cassettes and CDs and I don't get any money for it. So that's talk about being naive. Right. So he's got these CDs and cassettes and I'm like, oh my God. Yeah. And I didn't even realize it was an issue until I was talking to my brother. He's like, dude, you didn't set up COD? I said, yeah, I sent it to him. He's gonna send it to yeah, the COD. He's like, well, you didn't set up COD. I'm like, now here's me running a record label that, you know, at No Limit Records was selling, you know, thousands and thousands of records and we're making all making this money and we're doing these things and I didn't realize about COD crazy right so luckily Myron I don't like I said I don't know his last name he sent me the money for the COD COD CDs cassette he wired it to me so as soon as he got it he, he said I got it I'm gonna wire it to you right now I'm like okay okay so he wires it and we take that cash, I put some money in King's pocket, some money into my pocket so we can pay some bills. And then we fly to San Antonio, Texas, and we go down I-10, you know, we stop in Houston, and, and then we go down to Galveston a little bit, and we come back up, we go to New Orleans, we work our way all the way, uh, we go to Mobile, we go all the way to Pensacola and come all the way back. It took us about two, two and a half weeks. Get back to California, and about a week after that, I got a call from Southwest Wholesale. 
uh, named Mark Gammon. He was he was the guy there who did all the buying of the, the product. He says, man, I need X amount of units. I shipped him everything I had. And then he was like, oh, my God, it's going out the door. I need more units. And I ordered more units and more units. So I just started, you know, you know, and basically because we, you know, we were able to kind of pay in the manufacturer we were using new Southwest wholesale. Mm -hmm. And I finally had a conversation with Mark. I said, until you give me some money, I'm not going to be able to pay for all these albums that you want. So they sent me a check and I was able to pay back the credit card. I was able to pay for more manufacturing and then King and I could go back on the road. And in a matter of, after we got back from California, they order all that and we reordered and we were able to get stuff in another couple of weeks. About a month after that, we hit the billboard charts. Now it took a few months, but we hit the billboard charts. We were like 80, I think we we're at 80 on the billboard chart. And we were hot and everybody was excited and we're, we're starting to make money. And I think the challenge with that situation was you know, P's, you know, King still wanted to be with P because he, he loved him. He, that was his brother. And no matter what what we did or how the success we did had, he was frustrated. So I'll give you an example. Okay. If we're 80 on the billboard charts, um, you know, and I think this is interesting, but if we're 80 on the billboard charts, um, P is at 13, right? <laughs> right, right. We, we're at 69 on the billboard charts. P is at number one. We were we perform in front of five thousand people and make nine thousand dollars, and P is performing at the the summit, you know where the where the the Rockets the the, the Houston Rockets the NBA team used to play in front of fifteen thousand people, and I honestly thought that frustrated King so much because he was on this and understand Master P had a big priority deal that we signed when we were together, and priority you know they think about it they had you know they had did all the nwa stuff and and they were you know they had they had did all the ruthless stuff and the ice cubes and all that stuff so they were huge they were huge and we were just me pressing up units getting them out there going on the road king and i like back to back like batman and robin promoting so even though we were making a lot of money we were still in a situation where we weren't able to, to get the things we wanted to get to and do. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing about the story with the producer, AK, we paid him $87,000 for his work that he did for us. Wow. Mm. Now, the reason why I say that, and he oh, he was owed the money. I, you know, he was owed the money, we paid him. It's fine, not a big deal. But think about it, if I had three grand in my pocket, I could have just paid him three grand and, and, and he would have signed, released the, uh, he would have signed the release of all the songs and we would own, we would own a hundred percent of the songs instead of own, own, uh, owning 50%. Right. So him, he made $87,000. He's feeling pretty good about himself. Yeah, I could imagine. <laughs> And don't, and don't get me wrong, we were make we made a lot of money too, King and I made a significant amount of money. So we're not, you know, we're not complaining, we're not hating, but that kind of that kind of stuck in in King's Graw, King George's Graw, because he was like, you know, before this dude's doing two hundred, he's doing uh, he's doing song for two hundred dollars a song. Yeah. Now he's a Billboard charting, right? He's a Billboard charting producer, and he's charging people a thousand dollars to fifteen hundred dollars a song. Because we're on the Billboard charts and we're, we're hot, right? Right. Oh, come back to California, album's hot. We go to this, uh, I go to this place, and it's called Durant Square. It's kind of like a flea market, if you will. And there, there was a gentleman named, a gentleman from China. His, uh, his name was Leo. Now, Leo used to make all, all the No Limit gear that you see, you know, especially in the, the California Times and even in the Dallas South Hustlers, you see all the no limit hats and the jacket, the leather coat, all that. Yeah. Yeah, t shirts, all that stuff. Leo was the guy. So Leo made all that stuff. So I, I was in, you know, at this time, P's 13, we're 80, we're on the billboard charts. People know who we are. They don't understand it because they don't understand what the single is because. 
because you know when we meet with record company because we were meeting with record companies at that time and they would say what's your single and i would tell them i'm not here to sell singles i only sell albums i don't have a single i'm here selling albums i'm in the i'm in durant square and actually i'm with the with the producer ak and p comes around he has eight guys with him mm. there's a tall guy of him. so p comes around the corner and here's the thing never had a problem with p we were we were like family we split the only thing that was a problem i was still waiting on my money he still owed me four hundred thousand dollars and not to mention to, to there was an apartment that i got the apartment that i got for, for for the folks um and i don't know who did this but the, the apartment was damaged and the, and the manager called me and said either you pay for the, the damages or i'm calling the sheriff's office so you're talking about the apartment that you had to sign for because you're looking at this like it's it's a business deal. You know, we're all doing this. We're all in this together. I signed for this for you. And basically, yeah. the people that you had in, the, in in that apartment or whoever they had in that apartment trashed the Correct. damn thing. Correct. So I'm not saying it was me, an ex, or serve on whoever, but whoever that they had in the apartment trashed it, and they were telling me I needed to pay for that or figure that out, or they were going to call the sheriff's department. Mm. Now, understand, I am a not i'm not a street guy and i'm from i grew up my dad was in the military and i grew up in europe you know and i spent some time in new york because my mom's from new york some time in dc because my dad's in dc and i live in texas for a little bit but i'm a i'm like a german i'm like an american dude from germany who's a square who knows nothing about the legal system mm -hmm. and they're talking about calling the sheriff i'm like oh my god well, i gotta figure this thing out so P comes around the corner in this mall. I'm over there with Leo. And he was like, hey, what, I saw him first. I was like, hey. He was like, hey. Now, I think we both were shocked we saw each other. Right, right. So it was like, no. like So it almost like he immediately went on the defensive. Because he owes me 200 grand on a credit card, plus he owes me for this apartment. So he, And he owes me my 200000 We're at the $400,000. I still haven't got my money. It's several months. I've got a hit record. And I'm making money, but you know, four hundred grand. That's and at the, at the very minimum. I'm gonna be honest with you. If you would have just gave me the two hundred grand, so I didn't have to deal with with this American Express and and sending me collections and all that stuff, I would have been cool with that. Because you, that's something you could have at least walked away from, moved on, learned from, and then just keep building yourself into something better. Yes. So here's what happens he sees me i see him and i said hey we need to talk and he keeps asking me like who you with who you with and i'm like and i know i got the producer guy with me but i'm like i'm not trying to get him involved in anything i was like well, I'm, you know what are you talking about what do you why do you keep asking me this well he's wondering if king george is with me oh that's his, his mindset that's why he keeps asking me where who you with where you at what's going on like he he's he's a little bit kind of whatever and i said look we got to talk about some things why don't we go and, and I'm I'm at this counter, right? I said, why don't we go in this corner and we talk it out, talk it out? He said, why do you want to go take me over to the corner? I said, well, we got private business to talk about. He said, well, whatever you want to talk about, you could talk in front of everybody. I said, do you want to, them knowing about our business? He said, yes. I said, well, what about the American Express and the money you owe me for the record sales? And and after that, he was like, "Well, who you with, man? Who you who you?" With? I said, "No." I said, "I'm talk We're talking about this." He said, "You know what? Okay, let's talk over here." So he comes over, and my back's to the wall. We're and I'm thinking we're going to the corner to talk. He hits me out of nowhere. Who he who, still who, on me. who hits you? Master, Master P. He hits me. Whoa. So what happens is. I go to grab him because the reflection, I'm trying to hit him and I kind of swipe at him and hit like the back of his head and he kind of moves out. Well, the rest of these no limit guys come and then they start hitting me. So like anything, my father was in the military. I, I do know how to carry myself. I'm six, four and a half. So I'm not a little guy and I'm kind of, I'm, I'm covering up, hitting back, covering up, hitting back. And I happened to grab a guy and he had, and, and I grab him and I start kind of hitting him and these, all these guys are swinging and hitting me. But the crazy thing is they've got the guy that I'm holding. 
the guy that I'm holding, they're hitting him more than they're hitting me. So I got like a little scratch on my face and maybe a little bit of a bruise, but the, the person who took the brunt of that was this guy I'm holding, right? I'm using him to shield myself. Because they're just, they're just swinging and throwing at this point. They're just swinging and blowing. He's getting the, he's getting the business. Dang. So I see he has this gun, and the gun falls down on the ground. Now, I'm not a street guy. I don't know anything about that. I've shot guns before because, you know, military family and all that stuff. I took ROTC, so I'm, I'm, I'm very familiar. So I go down to grab the gun. Not to shoot anybody, but just to get these cats off me, right? Right. No one kicks the gun, and then I get hit, and then there's a stick like to my to like right next to me, and those retail sticks that you put up real high when like if you ever been to the mall and you see them putting those those shirts way up high, mm-hmm. and they have that retail stick. It happens to be one of them next to me, so I pick this thing and I start swinging right, and I start hitting people and I start swinging, and what happened was. Um, these guys pull their guns out. And here I'm thinking like, you know, I'm going to get shot. And I'm like, I want to make my way to one of these guys. I got to get to one of these guys before they shoot. Me. Well, the one thing I guess I can thank Master P for, he told those guys, don't pop them. Don't pop them. Don't shoot TC. The police are coming. Mm-hmm. So these guys, they're kind of looking around and they're seeing if the police are around. And P says, let's get out of here. They put their guns away. And they all run. So you're talking so, about a, basically like a six on one fight. It was really more like an eight on one fight because they were they were he had eight guys with him was eight D. Did you did you rec- well I don't know if I could even ask this did you recognize any of them? I recognized a few of them, but I mean some of these guys were like the new crew, the new New Orleans crew, ah. relative to P guys that were now watching his back. King wasn't in the picture. I wasn't in the picture. And then they ran. So that was the, so understand this. I've never had a disagreement with Master P other than when he says, that's it. I'm, I want my company back. And then I see him a few months later. All I want is just to get the money that's owed to me, specifically the credit card. And then he hits me and these guys jump me. So was that the, so was that his way of saying that he wasn't going to pay you or did you get paid or or I around? never to this day 20 some odd years later I've never received one check from Master P after we split up. There were no checks. I've never received it. Someone had told me after the No Limit Chronicles, "Well, yeah, man, you and P are cool now, right?" He took care of you cuz this one person knew what the situation was. I was like, "No, I never did." He was like, "Man, P told me he was going to take care of you." I said, "Well, he never did." So to this day and there's no animosity now because we're all, you know, we're all either we're in our we're either pushing fifty or we're in our fifties. So there's no animosity. There's no nothing. I've moved all my life. I have a pretty great life. But telling this story at the time, I'm really disappointed. I'm hurt. I'm frustrated. I'm still two hundred grand in the hall, and I'm not, and not quite two hundred because I'm 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 making payments. But it's like I got a baby on the way. And this is what we're this is what we're dealing with. Wow. So, police come, they ask me questions. I just tell them the truth. I said, "This is what happened. This is who it is." And Leo, the the, the Asian guy. So, to understand, the producers there behind the counter with Leo, seeing everything. AK is looking at seeing everything. And when AK tells the story, because my boys show up later, my god brother and, and and his crew, and they he used to own a store called Kicking It. He he came through and they were like ready to ready to get out right and ak is telling the whole story man you should have seen told man he was this and that and tc this and that and and one of my my god brother's best friends who worked with him at the store was like well, what the heck are you doing yeah. while my and he called me his friend while my brother is, is taking is taking this fight he was like man them dudes had guns i wasn't best with them so from that point People, people looked at me completely different. Like I was a street guy, I never was. It was like, and people, even though I'm six four and a half, nobody ever saw me as a big guy. They just, you know, I was just the guy. You know, I was just the guy taking care of business. So after that, Leo even asked me. He was like, you know, he, he's he's Chinese guy, broken English. He was like, why would P do that to you? 
Like you always, you guys were close. You always took care of each other. And I was like, dude, I don't even know. So please come. I tell them what happened. They're saying, why are you hanging out with these guys? I said, clearly I'm not. <laughs> They're clearly we're not friends. And he, he went down to Los Angeles. So whatever, whatever reason, um, King King wasn't around, but I saw I talked to King, and King came happened to come down, and he was like, "Where are they at? Where are they at?" And and you know, trying to find them, but you know, I found out later that he went to L.A. And I had a I was working on a magazine project with a guy named Mongo Nicole who worked at Forty Eighty Magazine, and a guy named Waylon Southern who was like a DJ. It was called Hip Hop Versus the World. It was like this we we had this vision of this hip hop magazine. And Two Shorts Retirement Party was on a Saturday, I think it was, if I remember correctly. So we all flew down to L.A. for this retirement party. And it was crazy because, like I said, I didn't, you know, I, I wasn't hurt. I just had a little scratch and a little bit of a bruise, but nothing that you could that you could really see that was anything because the guy I was holding was carrying, you know, was getting most the brunt of all the, the, the hits. Yeah. So I show we show up to... You know, we interview, so we go down Friday, actually. We interview, um, we interview Too Short for a thing in the magazine. We talk to him, we have a conversation. We show up to the party. Now, the party, it was huge. Everybody was there, all kinds of record executives, all kinds of industry people. Tupac was there, like everybody you can imagine was there. Mm -hmm. Well, P was there with his boy. So at this point, I am furious because someone said, man, I think I, uh, I saw P earlier. And I was like, where is he? And, it, and I will say this. I am not a street guy. I'm not a fighter guy. I'm not a gun-toting guy. Never have been. But at that moment, I was so furious. I was like, I don't care if he had 20 people with him. We are, I'm go we're going we're gonna to do something. Hmm. Now, he wound up leaving before because I heard that he, he heard – that I was there, and I don't know if that's true or not. That they say, well, he said you was there, and he didn't want to get in a confrontation with you in front of all these people, which is good because he, because he was the one who was probably more level-headed at that point, and I was just furious, and he left. I hadn't heard from Pete and hadn't talked to him since. We had a conversation in all these years. So, the question people ask me, they're like, well, why didn't you you sue P? He owed you this money, so. I'll, I'll tell you this. Okay. I saw eight attorneys to to try to sue P. And I will tell you, all eight of them turned me down. Now they were they were were not going to take it. Um, it was a concern because he was a priority, and he you know at that point he had a lot of money and he was rocking and rolling. And on the eighth attorney, there was this black guy, and. He was in San Francisco. I was in San Francisco, and I was like, you know, and at this point, I'm furious. I'm, I'm hurt. I sit down, you know, I sit down with this attorney, and he's the eighth guy, literally the eighth guy that I've had a conversation with, whether either on the phone or in person. Mm -hmm. He says to me, he, he says, clearly you're owed. I'm looking at this paperwork. Clearly you, I'm looking at these bills you're owed, but I'm going to tell you this. He said, P's at a point, Master P's at a point, he's got He's got money. He's got these records out. He's too valuable to priority. And they would keep you in court so long. Even if you saw money, it, you would be spending most of your money paying me. I mean, this is the greatest, I think at this point, the greatest advice he gave me. He says, look, I know you're hurt. And I know you're frustrated. And I know you're owed. I agree with you. But this is a bitter pill to swallow. But look at you. You're on billboard charts. You're starting a magazine. You're doing all these things. You need to swallow the bitter pill and move on. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did. And as frustrating as it was and as upset as I was at that moment, I did. Now, one thing we did do, we did do a disc record. And it's something I didn't want to do. But then when King was upset, then I was upset, and then we just said, okay, we're going to do a disc record. Mm. Now, we did do a disc record. It came out. It did well. And then after that, we were done with it. it was like it, We said we had to say we dropped the mic. We were done. We, can, it, it was over. Can I ask you this? Do, do, you yes. mind, do you mind giving us the name of the record? 
It's called uh, 31 Flavors. It's by King George and Cali G. It's not my finest moment, but we, you know, I was, you know, I'm 24 at the time and I'm upset. <laughs> I'm young, baby on the way. Guy owes me money. And, and, and you have to understand, I gave everything and gave my all to the label. And I was running the label and managing him and taking care of everything. And then to not even that. So, so there are other artists that say, hey, P owes me money. Maybe he does. Maybe he doesn't. I don't know. But my situation was different because I will tell you, I had a quantifiable number that was owed to me. And I'm, you know, I give up my credit. I give up my time. I put these ideas with him and we blow this thing up. And I'm the guy that gets gets, you know, attacked. And I'm the guy that is stuck with the bill. And he ghosted me. So how do you feel about the the Chronicles? Basically, the way that they told your story, because you didn't tell your story. They told your story or or a man, in a manner of speaking for you. How, like, yeah. what did you hear and how did you feel about it? Well, there's, there's a couple things that I heard with the story. One is that I was just a front guy and I didn't know what I was doing and I didn't do anything. And I will reiterate from 89 to 93, you know, no one was talking about P, but from 93, 94 to 96. And then obviously with, with the, the rise of No Limit, the when they talked about the rise of No Limit, I was there and I was running everything and P and I were side by side partners. So that, that was something. And the other piece of it was like, I was this guy that was trying to take over the company. So I sat down with No Limit for five, or excuse me, with the, beat, the, the producers of the, of the project for five and a half hours. At first they said, hey, we want to talk to you for an hour. They kept asking me questions and it went on for five and a half hours. And I gave them all the, the I gave them the truth, the information, the truth. And they even asked me about certain things that happened. Well, we heard that you were there when this happened to this. And I would say, yes, that's happened. That's what we did or no, or I'm not aware of that. I wasn't there or whatever for five and a half hours. So when you watch the No Limit Chronicles, it looks like I was a guy that didn't know what I was doing, and then I was trying to take over the company. So I, my thought process, and I want other people to understand, like, which is it? Am I the am I the novice business guy that doesn't know anything, or am I this diabolical genius that's taking that's trying to take over the company or do a hostile takeover, like like this was some sort of soap opera, right? Right. So I that's how I perceive. The other piece of it too was. I never had a conversation with any artist about leaving No Limit Records, ever. King and I never had a deal. King has done interviews and he'll tell you we never ever had a deal. In fact, he'll even tell you he never wanted to work with me, but he had to because that's all we, we, all we had was each other. So that, so those are the three things. One is I didn't know what I was doing. Two is I, uh, um, you know, I tried to steal the, the artists. And, and the third thing is like, that, that I was that type of person that was going to do that. Mm -hmm. Now, I will tell you, I was willing to kind of be like, okay, you know, it's Hollywood. Someone's got to be the bad guy. Why not let it be me? And after all these years, I'm not even mad about the, the, the fight. I'm not mad about the money. It is what it is. I, it was a bitter pill, and I, but I handled it and I swallowed it, and I took care of business and sold a lot of records, and I was able to do some great things. But I think what frustrated me is when Master P, P went on the tour of all these Access Hollywood and all these different TV shows and the Breakfast Club and all this stuff. And people were asking him because King George got very emotional in the episode, how he couldn't believe P left him and he teared up and everyone's, the, the story's heartfelt and everyone's saying, oh, oh my God, you and you and your, your best buddy King George and you split and he's so emotional and he's like, it broke my heart, it broke his heart. And then he says, but he got with the manager guy and the manager guy was in his ear and he's blaming the manager guy. Oh wow! Now he never says my name, but we know I'm the manager guy. I'm the guy. And that never happened. I never, that never happened. I never was in a situation where I was talking to artists. I never even like anything I was doing, like trying to put together publishing deals or whatever. That was something that we, if I made a buck, he's going to get a piece of that. Anything when they made a buck, I got 15% of that. That's how the whole deal worked. So I think my frustration about the No Limit Chronicles, they gloss over all of the things that were done, all of the things that were done by myself, even some of the things done by King George and other producers and people like EA Ski and those who were part of the, part of the journey. 
Now, I will say I I did get a phone call. They called me three times, and I, and I turned them down twice because I wasn't interested in doing an ode to Master P. Master P is the hardest working guy you'll ever meet. You'll never meet anyone like him. You'll never outwork him. He is relentless, and he's great at what he does. But I was why would I want to, uh, you know, give this ode to somebody who put me in a situation in debt and left me basically left me stuck for dead yeah. why would i do that that could that but, and that could have ruined any anybody else could have i mean being in that kind of debt in 1996 at 24 years old it, it just it could it could have if i was you know someone different i could have done something something to hurt myself or who knows did something that put me in jail or that because i was desperate but I think the thing that I that was frustrating when you're trying to blame me, like all of these things happened to me, and I'm the bad guy. And I just and that's at that point I said, okay, I was okay with the No Limit Chronicles, even though it was completely inaccurate. And look, Master P is Master P. He's not going to bring me on board if I'm not adding value. And clearly, I was there for from the time that things took off and getting the deal and doing the negotiation and doing all that stuff. And I was influential in saying, putting the Master P name on these albums that, that wound up blowing up. I was influential in saying, no, don't sign this artist deal. Um, I think, you know, the, the portrayal of him and I uh, meeting with uh, the Cash Money guys, that was funny. But yeah, we did meet with them and, and, and we wanted to do a deal with them. But... I think how I was portrayed was like, I was this guy, like I said, which is it? Am I the, if I'm the novice business person or am I the diabolical genius that's trying to take over the company? Mm -hmm. And I, I was a person who had ideas and strategies and focused on the core competency of what No Limit was. Um, I think P did a fantastic job of taking some of the concepts that we worked together. Like even the, the I'm Bout It movie, we we went and met with all the movie studios, and they were not interested in I'm about it. I would and love I, I would love for you to explain that part. Um, if, if yeah, you, sure. if you, yeah, if so, without without me really going into any detail, I would love to hear about how that kind of came about. As, yeah, far, as so, far as the whole band in theaters and all of that good stuff. Oh yeah, absolutely. So at the time, we went to all the the movie studios. So so Friday was out. It was popular. A buddy of mine, a guy who actually directed my movie, The Reverend Durong Ain't Right, who also did a couple of videos for us at No Limit, he said, man, you guys are selling records. You guys should just do a movie and just put it out, you know, on DVD or CD, I mean, DVD or VHS. I was like, no, that sounds like a good idea. So I went to P and I said, hey, you know, DMAR Grisham, David Grisham thinks we should do this. I think we could do it too. So he said, oh, that's a great idea. Friday's out's popular, so what do we do? We go and meet with all, because we were, you know, uh, TRU is popping, and it's like, okay, we've got a name, we're, 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 we're doing something. We got, and Friday was popular. Movie studios were willing to listen. They were looking for urban movie. So we went to all these places. They were not interested at all. They were like, no, we're not going to do that. So... I had turned, after our last meeting, I turned to P and I said, look, check this out. I said, if we just made an authentic movie, it doesn't matter how good it is, if we just made this movie, as long as we had a good soundtrack, the soundtrack will sell it, and we'll just tell people it's banned from theaters. So if it's banned from theaters, everybody's just going to go buy this DVD and buy this this soundtrack. Wow. So I, I remember um, when this came out, and I remember when it said, the, when it when I remember looking at it, it said banned in theaters. I was like, "Wow, I have to get this." And I think I, I I think I got it from Blockbuster Video at the time when they actually existed. That was the thing yeah. that actually caught my attention. So that was actually more like more that like more like a marketing ploy. Marketing, marketing ploy, yeah. Yeah, that was a marketing ploy because you know you saw the movie. The movie wasn't great. <laughs> Neither of us do. And honestly, I was. By the time the movie came out, I was no longer on. Um, I was no longer affiliated with Master P and No Limit. Mm -hmm. So what happened? We neither at that time we're trying to put this all together. Neither of us knew how to write a movie script. Neither of us knew how to put together a movie. I understood it 
understood production because my background's in broadcasting and, and communication. So I understood production, but I had never made a movie before. And, but Moon Jones, who wrote and directed the movie, was his basketball coach, oh. his AAU coach. And Moon Jones was a comedian. He wasn't huge, but he was well known on the comedy circuit. And he said, hey, my old basketball coach knows how to write a movie. Let's get with him. And that's what we got with Moon Jones and then started putting this whole thing together. But we split before that movie came out. And that was Officer Friendly for people who don't know. Yes, Officer Friendly. That's right. <laughs> yeah. But that was that movie was done. And the reason why it said banned in theaters, not because it was really banned in theaters. It was because it was a marketing ploy to get people to buy it and they buy the soundtrack. It was all about the, we talked about the value pack. I would always say, and this was a little bit more St. Charles, but I always pushed that. I said, look, if you have our album and you have Ice Cube's album and Ice Cube has 11 tracks and it is 1898 and we have 20 tracks or 21 tracks for a double CD and we're charging 1698 or 1798 for a double CD, we've got a chance to, to get in on some of Ice Cube's sales for that week. Mm -hmm. And that was the concept. So yeah, band in theaters was not really band in theaters. It was just <laughs> a way to do it. I'm sure uh, Master P is very happy that you did. Absolutely. Because I didn't pay <laughs> any money from that either. So. <laughs> Man, yes, absolutely. I can't, I can't tell you how much stuff I bought. About the only thing I never did do was sending in money to try to get T-shirts. That's about the only thing I did not do. Well, we, you know, um, we always made sure if it's very rare, people, when I was there, I always made sure I, people got their t-shirts. So as soon as we got a check from them back then, they'd only give us a check or they send cash, which was, was funny. And so the $20, $40, whatever it is, I always made sure I had the envelopes at the office and put it, put it in there. I take it to the, uh, take it to the post office and make sure everybody got their stuff. Nice. That was, what, that was important to me. That was important to P. We net fans were everything to us. If P, if we did a concert in the early days, we do a concert and there'd be like twenty people. We would, we we would do the best show we could, and we try to give out stuff. And, and I mean, we do a show in front of 20, 30 people and give out thirty. We give out thirty CDs and thirty T-shirts, and we literally lost money. But it was the 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 customer or the the fan was the most important part. And we, we always made sure if someone spent their money, they got their money's worth. That's why they got the value back. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Um, I don't really know how much else you want to add. I think you have told us a significant amount. Clearly, that was not told in the Chronicles, but just really just for, for people who are like me, who uh, really just love the education, not only about the South, but about No Limit, the you know, the whole thing that, that kind of went on there in this particular period of time, like I say, is really interesting to me because, like I say, you know, I grew up on that music. I started listening to Master P in some of those failed projects, you know what I mean, <laughs> kind of early on. But like I say, yeah. you know, just the whole genesis of it um, coming up into even even like now, you know, I've, yeah. I've followed it. It's interesting to me. I know more people out there will probably like to see and hear this or whatever. So I do hope that people click the likes, share, subscribe, you know, not only to, to, to hear, you know, this missing part of the story, but just, you know, to continue to share and just kind of follow what you and, and, and currently what you got going on. Do you want to remind people what you all, what you have going on right now or any products you got websites yeah, or anything? Absolutely. So, um, I've got the Costin and hammer network, CHN, uh, it is podcasts, it's comedy, it's a variety of things. And we're, we're really focused on raising, raising money and that money is is for the special olympics so if you you know you may know someone who's uh who's challenged and maybe they're part of the special olympics they do such great work so um uh, one of my former students josh hammer has now become my partner on this project cost and hammer network and we're really focused on giving back to the community and really doing doing something uh with that great cause the other thing is um only in california if you are in california we have psycho cider it's a hard cider uh 6.7 percent alcohol 
less than three grams of sugar. It's California apples picked, pressed with different flavors. We have uh, Mother of Dragons, which is raspberry dragon fruit, and Kiwi Herman, which is Kiwi lime. Um, you can you can get that in uh, in your in California. Uh, they, at first, we we're all always in on premise, and we had kegs. Now we have cans. Okay. Um, there's a few artists that I help. Um, uh, one named JLN, great young up and coming uh, musician and singer and, and artist. Uh, Kazi, who uh, has had some success. Uh, C O Z Z Y, uh, great rapper. And Ben Trax is a producer, hip hop as well as EDM. Those guys are great. So I, I will just say, um, just working on those projects, trying to give back to the community. If you could do something with a, with a, a, something in community, whether it's Special Olympics or Make-A-Wish, just do something to give back. That's important. So I just want to say thank you very much for allowing me to kind of tell, tell my story. And I think ultimately, if it wasn't for... You know the, the the chronicles of self. It is what it is. But when we're we're going on a on a tour and folks are saying the manager did this and the manager did that, I just thought it was important for me to have conversations around that. So thank you very much for allowing me to use your platform to talk about the things that I've done and the successes I've had. And don't forget to check out the Reverend Do Wrong Ain't Right. It's for free on YouTube at the Costin and Hammer Network. So oh, thank you so much. I will absolutely show that again. And if you don't mind, I want to give a quick shout out to to my guy, Kurt. So hopefully he gets a chance to watch this man for for not only for reaching out and just to let people kind of know I had I had did an interview that was on the channel and I will put this into our playlist into the uh, the no limit playlist. So you guys can find this uh, interview a little bit easier. But he had saw an interview that I did. He reached out, he emailed me, I think the day before I went to New Orleans and we got a, an opportunity to kind of speak and Again, I'm gonna say this. I'm I'm humbled. I'm honored, and thank you right. so much for for having a level of trust and in my platform and, and coming on and speaking your story. Absolutely, thank you. I'm humbled too, and you know, anytime I have an opportunity to talk to folks, I have no problem with having an honest con conversation with folks. So I appreciate your time. One person has one more question. Let me ask this: Are you hey. currently looking for any artists right now? Are, are should should artists seek seek you out or seek your your company out or anything like that? Like, what are you doing with artists? So, I'm I, only thing I'm doing is kind of assisting. So, if you, uh, I'm not looking for artists. I am retired from the music industry. But if there's something, if you have a sound or something, and I could forward you on to someone to help you out, I would definitely do it. So you can get on my website. Uh, it's my first name, Tobin, T-O-B-I-N. My last name, Costen, C-O-S-T-E-N.com. TobinCosten.com. You can shoot me a message there. Um, if you got some music, uh, you can also go on my Instagram, Tobin Costen. Pretty simple. Uh, so if you hit me on Instagram at Tobin Costen or hit me at TobinCosten.com, you can easily reach out to me. And if you've got some music or something, I could probably forward it to somebody that may be interested in working with them. Um, and yeah, and that's pretty much about it. So um, not in the game anymore, retired, not looking to get back in. I've just kind of support folks, young folks that are trying to put their music together. If I can help, I will. Sounds great, man. Again, told him, brother, thank you so much for coming on and you enjoy the rest of the evening, man. And I look forward to talking to you again. Okay. Sounds good. Take care, Justin. I appreciate you. Be safe, guys. And uh, make sure you guys wear your mask, wash your hands, be safe. This COVID-19 is real. Yeah. See sure. you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Bye now. Bye. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let me take myself off the screen here. And I'm going to play that, uh, that movie preview again. Again, this is Reverend Do Wrong. You guys, make sure to check this out. I thought it was really, really cool. And we're going to go ahead and stop the uh, the replay right here for the people on the replay. Please make sure you guys click that thumbs up. I will post this again, a, uh, a little bit of a condensed version of it. But again, thank you guys so much for coming through and y'all have a great evening.